In the course of my entire life, I've never met a group more racist than Philadelphia police dogs. And what I want to do in this video is explain why they're racist. They're not born that way. They're not trained that way. They learn racist behavior. I worked at a center city Philadelphia parking lot right downtown near City Hall for about 16 years. I worked from the, the lowest job as a, you know, a runner. I became a garage manager. I was even a part-time supervisor. Long time, like the first half of my 32 years I spent down there, learned a lot, witnessed a lot of crime, witnessed a lot of corruption, witnessed a lot of things that most kids going to a private Catholic school at the age of 16 don't see. Saw it all. Very important, I think, to my personal development. To understand me, you'd have to understand the years I spent down there. One of the things I learned about down there were how the Canine Corps worked. Center City, Philadelphia, I think it was the Ninth District, pretty sure. And the whole time I was there, there were canine cops down there. Now, the canine cop unit was, you know, what was a canine cop? Well, you had the cop himself. They were all male. They wore boots. They wore these little legging things. They had the peaked white cap, sort of like the highway patrol guys. They had usually a German shepherd, big dog, with a harness with this big handle on it. And they had a Jeep. In those days, they were Jeep Cherokees. I mean, they were the original SUVs, I guess. And there really wasn't any competition. And the Jeep Cherokee would be, they were blue and white, you know, canine on it with a unit number. And uh, you had a uh, fence between the dog in the back and the two front seats. What I learned very early working down there was that most of the canine Jeeps that worked in that area parked their Jeeps in our parking lot. There were certain corners we would leave for them, dark in, in the recesses of a garage, where they could put the Jeeps so the dogs could just chill out and sleep. And of course, the obvious question I had as a, a young kid working down there was, <laughs> why aren't the dogs working? Because the canine cops would park the Jeeps, leave the dog, and they'd go out on the street. Now, I started off working at night, so I was basically, you know, 4 to 12, which was the canine cop shift at night in Center City, Philadelphia. And until about 10 o'clock, they would patrol the streets down there on foot, alone. And then around 10, 9.30, 10.30, somewhere around there, they'd come back, they'd get the dogs out of the Jeeps, and then they'd go out with the dogs. And of course, the obvious question was, why are they walking around with the dogs at, at 4 p.m.? Why do they wait till 10 p.m.? And that's because, as I learned from the many canine cops that I got to know, they couldn't because the dogs, after six months, or sometimes less, went racist. Racist, as they put it, went racist. Why? The training of the dogs did its best to avoid connecting any particular ethnic or gender to criminality. So when they were trained, one day there would be, uh, you know, the people would come out, the would-be perps with their armored clothing on and armored gloves so they didn't get chewed up by the dogs. And one day the perps would be white males. Another day they'd be white females. Another day they'd be black males. Another day they'd be black females. Another day there'd be a Hispanic guy, a Hispanic woman, uh, Asians. And they did their best to make sure the dogs didn't associate criminality with any particular ethnic or gender. And this is the 1970s, so in those days, you have to remember it was a lot easier. We only had two genders in those days. Uh, a lot's changed. So they did their best so that the dogs coming out of training weren't racist. They didn't associate criminality with any particular ethnic group or gender. The problem was, in Center City, Philadelphia, the overwhelming majority of street crime, as opposed to white collar crime, which you know, detectives are looking after, but street crime was basically committed overwhelmingly by young black males, what the police just call YBMs, on a good day. Uh, 
and I can attest to that. You know, I worked on air 16 years. I witnessed at least three dozen crimes. These ranged from, you know, car theft at one end uh, to the, ho- the worst I saw was my assistant manager get shot in the head. I mean, I had my life threatened. I had a straight razor at my throat one night. Uh, I saw a lot. Of those, and I think I've talked about this in another video, of the roughly three dozen crimes I witnessed, not one was committed by a Native American, male or female. Not one was committed by an Asian, East or, East or South Asian, male or female. Not one was committed by a Latina. One was committed, one of 36, uh, a young Latina guy, Latino guy. And not one was committed by an African-American woman, young, old, any age, didn't matter. 35 of the 36 were committed by young black males. So I know personally, you know, toward the end, I always kept an eye on young black males. I, if I saw, you know, uh, an Asian guy hanging around, it, 16 years, I'd never had an, seen an Asian commit a crime. I'm not saying say Asians do not commit crimes, grand or petty, but I'd never seen one. Every crime I had witnessed, every crime, you know, that I ended up getting involved with or witnessing, including one guy, one guy literally ran down a guy who had had an altercation over at the bank, caught on myself. They were all young black males. Now, intellectually, I can detach myself to a great extent from that and not draw improper conclusions. But you still are doing profiling in your work. You'd be stupid not to. You can't keep an eye. We had, you know, two entrances and you could only watch one at a time. You're going back and forth, back and forth. You pay more attention to the people you know are likely to fit the character of the other, you know, the three dozen crimes you've observed. And it's the same with the dogs. They get down into Center City, Ninth District, and after somewhere between four and six months, they go racist. Because night after night, perpetrator after perpetrator, they're always fit the same profile, young black males. One of the other reasons they parked the Jeeps in our lot at night instead of on the street was, and I've witnessed this many times, if young black guys were walking down the street and they saw the police Jeep with the dog in the back, they'd go over and get on different sides of a Jeep and they'd pound on the windows and make noises. And the dogs would freak out, going, you know, jumping back and forth from side to side to side to side to side. And the dogs would be like foaming at the mouth, trying to get out to get these guys. And I used to think, you know, what do they think is going to happen when these dogs are walking the street and they walk by? I mean, they're basically, these young black guys, anytime they would park the Jeeps on the street, they saw the dogs. They were training the dogs to hate young black men. And I, I must have witnessed it two scores of times, anytime they were out there. That's why they used to, if they could, they would get the Jeeps into our lot because it was better for the dogs because the dogs would get all worked up. And when you'd go out to patrol with the dog, the dog was ready to kill the first young black guy he saw. That dog had been trained, but he wasn't trained by the police department. He was trained by those young black males pounding on the Jeep anytime they saw this. And I saw this over and over and over again. And then the dogs get trained just through the process of apprehending criminal after criminal after criminal after criminal, and they all fit the same profile, virtually all. You know, it's it's just like me. It's 35 out of 36 crimes committed by young black men. And it's the same for the dogs. But the dogs, I mean, dogs are intelligent, but they also get trained. You know, if you do do the same thing for a dog, you know, you give a, you give a dog, a dog does something, you give it a treat, the dog will do it again. I mean, that's what you do. You're training the dogs. And then essentially, essentially what happens is on the street, the dogs get trained to associate young black men with criminality. And you can see that. You can see the dogs lunging. And remember, the cop, they've got a harness on these dogs, and it's big and it's strong. But, you know, the harness, the cop's arm's out about a meter close to a meter, depends on the cop. Some are bigger, some are small. And then you've got the harness, and then you've got, you know, the harness is around the dog's chest. The dog's head and and mouth is out ahead of the harness. So you've got somewhere between four and five feet. If you were within the range of a canine cop, 
even with his hand firmly on the harness, if if that dog lunges at somebody, if you're within four or five feet of the cop, the dog's going to get you before the cop gets the dog under control. That's why they would leave the dogs in my parking lot because they couldn't take them on the street because the center city around like Chestnut Street primarily, if you think of it, the, the sidewalks are pretty wide, but they were really crowded at night. This is where all the, the movie theaters are and there's restaurants and all kinds of things going on down there. It's pre-COVID, of course. And the sidewalks would be crowded and the cops could not walk down the sidewalks with the dog because they were afraid the dog would bite somebody, somebody innocent, probably a young black male. They would bite just for simply walking down the street past them. Because all the dogs know, the dogs aren't, you know, assessing criminal behavior. The dogs just see a type and they go and they've been trained. They've been trained by their experience. They've been trained by these young black guys pounding on the windows. These are the people that they hate. These are the people who, who drive them nuts. So that's why they would leave the dogs in the jeeps till around 10. By that point, the sidewalks would kind of thin out and then they would bring the dogs out and patrol late at night where if there were, there were problems, they could use the dogs and, and keep them under control. So that's why Philadelphia police dogs were racist. I can't speak for other cities. Maybe somebody lives in another city, they can leave a comment. But you know, I got to know those cops. I got to know the dogs. And in every case, every cop, same story, four to six months, dogs go racist. But the question I have is like, what happens to policemen? I mean, what happens to the cops? You send these cops down into these districts that are overwhelmingly African-American and the crimes committed overwhelmingly by young black males. I mean, intellectually, the cops are superior to the dog. So maybe it doesn't, they're not going to go racist in six months if they're, they have a brain. But at what point, after a year, three years, five years, six years, at what point does that happen? You know, can you be a policeman and arrest night after night or day after day after day, overwhelmingly young black males and not have it affect you? I know, like I said, I wasn't a cop. I was just a garage manager, but I know it affected me. I knew you know, every car we had stolen, and I had probably 20 stolen over my 16 years from the garages I managed, every one was stolen by a young black male, 100%. I never had a car stolen by any other ethnicity or any other uh, gender or any other age group. I mean, I never had a 50-year-old black guy steal a car. It just never happened. Never saw it. Never heard about it. You know, it, it, it does affect you. And that's the problem. You know, tr I don't know what extent training will take care of that. And, and that, that's a problem. We get, that's how our minds work. It's, it's called learning. But sometimes you can learn the wrong things. And these dogs learn the wrong things. And the dogs ended up racist. And, and, and long, as long as the environment is the way it is, until the environment changes, I don't think you can put people down there in that environment who over a period of years are not going to go the route of the dogs. Maybe they, they won't go as extreme, one would hope. But you, you can't go into that environment and not be, infect, not be affected by it. It affected me. It affected me for years. When I didn't work there anymore, I, I was still watching people. I mean, the things I did when I worked in Center City, for example, moving around at night, sometimes we'd have to carry money, cash. I used to zigzag down the sidewalks. You'd, you'd walk to the right and look over your left shoulder, and you walk to the left and look over your right shoulder. When I got to Washington, <laughs> D.C., I was working for the Navy. We were walking up from the Navy Yard to go get a sub the subway somewhere. I was working with my boss and a couple of coworkers. And 
they were talking and I wasn't paying attention. I was walking a little bit ahead of them and I was zigzagging and looking over my shoulder. <laughs> and they asked me, what the hell was wrong with me? But that's how I learned to walk around Center City, watching my back all the time because you never, if anything came at you, it was going to come from the back. You know, working in these environments affects you and it affects the police. It affects the police dogs. It affects the police, policemen themselves. And until we change these environments, we're never going to get away from some of the problems that we associate with the interactions of police, police in those environments. Anyway, that's my tale of racist police dogs in Philadelphia. If you have a comment, please leave it. Subscribe to the channel if you can. Give it a, the video a thumbs up. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. And until the next time, keep fighting.